Hello? Hello? This is Watch Station Epsilon 38. The Red Pool's just entered a period of extremely high activity. It keeps birthing these creatures. They're extremely hostile and unpredictable. And we need backup. Repeat, we need MTF units at Watch Station Epsilon 38 immediately. Hello? Command? We're going to need MTF Omega 7. Yes, I'm positive. Open Pandora's box. Hey, hey, hey. What do you think you're doing? What? You waved me through. You're allowed through, Doctor. But no contraband material, though. What are you talking about? No coffee's allowed at this site, sir. You've got to be kidding me. Alright, day one of the Red Pool Exploratory mission. Rotten sort of day to begin something like this, I tell ya. Rumor has it that last night there was a total containment breach in some area or another. Then it turns out that there's no coffee allowed anywhere inside of Area 354. God knows why. And the whole mission almost ended in disaster when it turns out that they almost forgot to load the extra fuel on board. Who exactly is running the show around here? Anyway, we're now underway. Once everyone was on board, they set the rig in the pool, and we started diving a little while ago. I have to give the R&D guys their due, and this thing is impressively engineered. It's basically a submarine with a drill attached to it. It's not hydrodynamic at all, but we're not really going swimming here. We know that the red pool gets denser as you go down, so we'll probably have to start digging soon. In fact, for a while there, I had a definite feeling of going downward, but now we're dropping much more slowly. The pilot, Marty, says we're sinking at a rate of 10 meters an hour. Apparently at this depth, the pool is already getting pretty dense. It'll be slow going for a while, and that's fine by me. After everything that happened out here, I'm not exactly excited to see where those abominations came from. At about 4.30 AM, gravity suddenly changed direction. Boy, that was a fun way to wake up. We're now rising rather than sinking, which means we're more than halfway there. We've reached the surface. Through the portholes, it's mostly dark, which means it's night. We can't go out yet because for all we know, the atmosphere could be hydrochloric acid. We've got a ton of sensors outside of the ship analyzing a bunch of stuff, whether the air is breathable, what kind of airborne bacteria we have to deal with, and simple stuff like temperature. We'll know in eight hours whether it's safe for human life out there. Surprisingly enough, it turns out the air is totally safe. It's surprisingly normal here, and it's winter on this side too. Good thing we brought our Canadian cold weather gear. Except it's been night for going on 20 hours now. What's going on? Dawn finally came. The sun was huge and red. Big surprise, I know. I'm a biologist, but I know enough about astronomy to know that we're orbiting a totally different star. Is this a different time, a different place, or a different dimension? The D-Class, Leroy, guessed that we're in another plane of existence, and I think he's probably closest. The pool on this side is way bigger. More like a large pond or maybe a small lake. The banks are more defined than on our side as well. Marty had to stay with the sub, so Leroy Swanson and I took an inflatable raft to the shore and headed north. The ground here, or at least around the pool, is almost totally devoid of plant life. The only green we saw was a sort of fuzzy moss growing on the ground that looked more like a kind of mold. The ground is grayish tan dirt that's like a mixture of sand and flour. Swanson said it was some mineral or another, but I forgot what he called it. I half expected all of our electronics to not work out here, but that wasn't the first thing to fail. After about two hours of hiking across flat boring ground, the compass suddenly changed direction. Now it points to what we had previously thought to be east. Evidently, this planet's magnetic field doesn't work the same way ours does. I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't even a planet, at least in the way we would think of it. Not wanting to risk getting lost, we immediately made a 180 and headed back to the ship. 
I could have sworn that the trip back was less than half as long as the trip out. Tomorrow we'll work out a way of navigation that doesn't rely on the compass being sane. We all had a lousy night's sleep. The sun never went down. By my calculations, the day-night cycle here seems to last about 43 and a half hours, as opposed to the 24 hours back home. That's going to take some getting used to. It just occurred to me that there's been no wind at all in this place. The result is dead silence. I'm not ashamed to admit that the overall emptiness of this place is pretty scary. We found an area with none of the moss stuff for a few hundred feet around and decided to camp for the night. The sun is still up, but it's time for us humans to sleep, so I'm calling it night. Sometime in the night, which was really daytime, we were all awoken by some kind of roar. You remember what the T-Rex sounded like in that old movie Jurassic Park? It sounded a lot like that. Big and reptilian. It was so loud that I was certain whatever was making it couldn't be more than 20 feet away. But when we all got out of our tents, we didn't see anything. The whole area is so flat that we'd see any sort of animal within a half mile or so, but there was nothing. We packed up camp and continued on. In the distance, the land seems to grow more hilly, and I think I see trees. Where there's that amount of plant life, there'll be fauna too. Considering what kind of creatures came out our side of the pool, I'm a little scared. But at least this long journey might be getting more interesting soon. The bare ground has ended. Now we're walking across a vast field of beautiful grass. It almost looks like a well-mown lawn. The grass seemed ordinary enough until Swanson tripped over a rock and arose to find his hands covered with several dozen bloody pinpricks. Apparently the tip of a blade of this grass is incredibly sharp and easily punctures skin. It's no threat to our foundation issue boots, but we all have to be careful not to fall on it. We came to a tiny stream, really no more than a trickle. Swanson suggested we could refill our canteens, but Leroy wanted to check the water for something or other first. Swanson took out some equipment and, after a few minutes, announced that it was not water, but liquid carbon dioxide. CO2 is usually a gas at this temperature, and it's never a liquid. The laws of physics don't seem to be working right. Haven't had time to record anything for a few days. We made it to an area sparsely populated by trees. The trees were ordinary, looked like birch, but the leaves were wrong. At some point, we lost Leroy. This place is so quiet that none of us really feel comfortable talking, so we have no idea when we lost him. There's a good eight hour window where he could have gone missing. We called to him, but none of us wanted to split up to look for him. During the night, a tree fell on Swanson's tent. He wasn't hurt and none of the gear was damaged, although the tent got mangled beyond repair. Swanson swears that the tree hadn't been that close when he pitched the thing, and none of us can tell what caused it to fall. The trunk just snapped. We agreed not to pitch our tents anywhere near a tree from now on. The next day, which was really nighttime, we heard the same roar from a few days ago. It sounded exactly the same as before, and again we have no idea what made the sound. We can't even agree which direction it came from. Now that it's just the two of us, it felt weirder sitting in silence, so I asked Swanson a bit about himself. He's divorced and pretty down on his luck from what he told me, and he's equally irritated about the coffee ban on the other side of the pool, but he doesn't know anything about why it isn't allowed. Maybe if this mission goes well, he can request a transfer to a more normal site. Well, as normal as they get in the Foundation. What seemed to be a huge cliff in the distance turned out to be an artificially constructed wall. It's made of solid rusty iron and it stands maybe 50 feet high. To the left and to the right it goes on farther than the eye can see. I can't imagine how thick it is. We have no way around it. Our options were to go over it or through it, so Swanson Jerry rigged some kind of blowtorch thing with our equipment. I swear this guy is MacGyver. We cut a hole in the iron wall big enough for us to go through. It turns out it's only about a quarter of an inch thick, but there's another wall behind it with less than a foot between. 
Apparently this thing has multiple layers. Swanson cut through eight of them before we finally made it to the other side. The grass on this side is black. Not burnt or anything, it's just a different color. And finally there's some wind. I was getting tired of- We pass through the second barrier, and we're back to the weird place with the black grass. I half expected the holes we cut through the walls to have sealed up or something, but they were still there, thank god, or whoever runs the show in this world. I don't think Swanson is going to make it through the night. He lost a lot of blood. I awoke to find that Swanson had crossed. I didn't want to do it, but I had no choice but to terminate him. I'm sure that something back home might have been able to help him, but I couldn't afford to have him slow me down. There are only a few more days until- I made it back to the ship with only an hour or two to spare. The first thing Marty asked was what had happened to Swanson and Leroy, as if a few dead team members are our biggest problems right now. Marty has us underway, and we're definitely sinking. I just hope they don't- Thanks for watching the video. This was our first ever Patreon pick, hand selected by these wonderful people on screen. If you want a chance to vote on what SCPs we cover in future episodes, check out the link in the description below. We want to make a very special thank you to Chuko, Matthew, Rio, Blake, Michael, Pumpkin Pyromaniac, and that saxophone guy for being our top donors. Thanks again for watching, stay safe out there, and we'll see you all next week.